guys. So um, I always wait till three minutes after to officially start. So now that it's 8.03, I can um, officially welcome Dr. Erica Brown for our own um, Nitzelmacht, as it were. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the, the evening before, um, before Christmas, um, although that's of course not why we're meeting, I just thought that this is a night where more than anything, people are likely both to be home and also to have some free time on their calendar and um, that, uh, that people would be able to come and to hear Dr. Erica Brown's words of both Torah um, and lessons um, from from Lord Rabbi, I always forget which one comes first, Jonathan Sachs, who I know was a, a tremendous um, teacher of yours and of course for the world. And, and so we're really, really grateful to you, to, uh, to you for coming. Um, and I'll just turn the floor over to you if that's okay. I know that you are okay. not someone who needs an introduction <laughs> for this crowd, so. Yeah. Nor do I want one. So um, <laughs> I wanna thank Maharat Ruth for having me and to thank Rabbi Hertzfeld. It's always a pleasure to um, to see my friends at Ohev Shalom and to spend time with you. Um, when Maharat Ruth asked me and suggested this date, I said, well, I don't know. I mean, people usually are away and then realize that I have nothing to do. So maybe you have nothing to do. So let's do something special tonight. And um, and yeah, uh, so what I want to share with you is some uh, Torah from Rabbi Sachs, but I want to begin by actually talking a little bit about my relationship with him. Um, I, I've done about 10 different tributes to Rabbi Sachs. Uh, I was speaking with a friend of mine who, uh, who edited his books and she's done about 19. So, and I say that because I've been speaking to a variety of his disciples and, um, and I think all of us are really very, very deeply grieving and, um, and, it's, and it's been very, very hard. We've all been in touch with each other in different ways. And that's been actually one of the most beautiful things that has happened in this past month and a half is that, um, that, that many of us connected with each other and with a, a time period where, that where we had spent um, years together studying and learning with him and teaching. So Rabbi Sachs, I, uh, I got married at 21. Um, you can lecture me later or in the chat room about that being just too young. Um, but anyway, I moved to England because my husband was in medical school there in um, University College. And, um, and I did not know how to drive. And you're gonna see why this is significant in a moment. So I did not know how to drive and we bought, and I was uh, teaching at Jews College in a program. Uh, actually two programs. I ran a, a program with the Hebrew University at, uh, at Jews College, which Bar Hashem, they got rid of the, the name Jews College and now it's the London, uh, it's the uh, LSJS, London School of Jewish Studies. So um, so anyway, I'm in Jews College and we lived on Victoria Road and, and uh, Jews College is on Albert Road. So if you know anything about British history, you know that Victoria and Albert are right next to each other. And the college was about half a block from my home, a block or half a block from my home. And I spent a huge amount of time in the college. In fact, a friend visited from the United States and uh, Rabbi Sachs was at that time what, what's called the principal of the college, right, which would be like the dean, the provost, and um, he was not yet chief rabbi, he was several years away, and the chief rabbi at the time was Emmanuel Jakovitz, and his wife was um, Lady Emily Jakovitz, and uh, we had spent time with the Jakovitzes, and, um, and I began not only working um, alongside Rabbi Sachs, in the college, but I decided to do a master's underneath him, and he was my he was my thesis advisor. Um, and what I want to share in those years uh, is uh, the thing I, because these are my first teaching years of observing a master educator and watching him compose his classes and paying attention to how he reads, paying attention to the way in which he pauses and reflects and responds to students, uh, the way he prepares material, the outside sources that he would bring in from a variety of uh, his philosophers, right? Alistair McIntyre, Charles Taylor, Hobbes, Locke. Um, there were certain more contemporary figures. There were certain figures who are important as enlightenment philosophers that regularly came up in his classes. In et on ethics, he was, you know, he was, that was his uh, his PhD, and he had studied under some of the great and brilliant English philosophical minds of the day. And you felt when you were in a class with him that he brought those to the fore. In fact, someone said something really interesting to me. Said that um, in reflecting on Rabbi Sachs's legacy, 
when you have very, very smart people, sometimes when you're studying with them, you, you feel that they're impressive and you know how smart they are. But what Rabbi Sachs had the gift of was to distill very complex ideas from complex thinkers and make you feel smart. And as rather than feel intimidated by how impressive another person is, you felt really um, held by the spell of the ideas and as, as if you were in the room with some of these figures and studying with them. One of the things that I observed the most in Rabbi Sachs's life, um, as I visited him in his, in his home at the time in Golders Green before he moved to St. John's Wood, um, what I saw in Rabbi Sachs was the tremendous amount of reading he did. He, uh, he and his, his pile of books was, uh, you know, was always intimidating. Um, later, I learned from his brother, Alan, after, after Rabbi Sachs passed away, I've been in touch with Lady Elaine and, um, and his daughter, Gila, and his son, Josh, and his brother, Alan. And Alan shared um, in a tribute that he did that Rabbi Sachs read a book a day. So I wanted to verify this before sharing this with you. And I spoke with Dan Sacker, who works in the in, in who works in Rabbi Sachs's office and in many ways was responsible for Rabbi Sachs when Rabbi Sachs was on the road. Apparently he was always reading and uh, very close to always missing buses, trains, whatever else, you know, transportation they had, because he was always absorbed in a book. And um, and Dan said to me that you know there was a constant stream of Amazon packages to the office. Sometimes he would get a book in the morning, and by the afternoon, and these were not thin volumes nor easy volumes. He would walk out and say, "Dan, you must read this book. It's excellent." Um, so he he and he just couldn't understand what what actually happened um, in those hours behind your door and my door. Um, how did you how did you read as much as you read? Um, and I think actually that was one of the keys to understanding Rabbi Sachs's prolific writing was that he had a lot of input that translated into a lot of output. He was able to constantly feed the curiosity and come out with ideas. And one of the, the things that I clarified with Dan, I said, you know, I, I've noticed, and I'm gonna share that with you this evening, that there were a lot of similar themes that Rabbi Sachs wrote about in his lifetime, and they resurface often in books. So if you read Morality, um, as, um, as, 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 um, it's, as Stuart pointed out that he, he's in the middle of, and I certainly highly recommend that you read it, you'll notice that there are a lot of things that he talks about, uh, the impact of technology, loneliness, uh, the importance of community, the importance of marriage and family, you'll see those themes again and again in his writing. And what Dan said to me was that was actually an act of discipline, that Rabbi Sachs would have multiple ideas um, every day about things that he wanted to write about, think about, and that he was disciplined by others in the office to sort of uh, make it stick, keep honing the same points and saying them in different um, in in in, uh, in in different uh, ways to the point that when Rabbi Sachs would finish a lecture, he would turn to people who were his his handlers, his his office uh, his office staff, and say, "Well, you know, was that okay? Was that okay? Did I, did I you know knows did I did I veer off the uh, veer off the program?" Um, so the reading and writing is important. Um, the other thing, and I wrote about this in a, in a tribute that I did to Rabbi Sachs um, in the Times of Israel, is I had the gift of being able to teach in his shul in Marble Arch and spend a number of holidays there, specifically Shavuot. And uh, Rabbi Sachs, in, um, I got to see him not in the towering way that many people on this call experienced him in lectures or on videos, but I got to see him with his congregants, um, with older members of the congregation holding their hands, making sure they had challah and grape juice, making sure that they had company, checking in with them. And that's a side to Rabbi Sachs that many people were, were not exposed to, but I had the gift of having a front seat before he became the chief rabbi. I also want to talk about two other things. Uh, one of them is that Rabbi Sachs is largely responsible as the, I'll call it the ideological figurehead who created the Manual College in, um, in London, which was built after I left London, but it was, and it was dedicated to Emanuel Jakobowicz, the former chief rabbi. And Rabbi Sachs um, 
before he uh, before he campaigned for the school, he created uh, a document, and I can't find it. Um, and it's not it, it predates um, all the computer um, all the computer files that we currently have, where he he created an ideological portrait of a graduate of a school, because he wanted before he actually built the physical school, the bricks and mortar of the school, he wanted to understand what kind of graduate um, do we want? And then let's build it backwards. Um, let's build it, you know, it's really leadership by design before we had that expression. And I was very struck by that in conversations that I had with him. He was very, very concerned about the future of modern orthodoxy. And he, he felt that in order to have, for modern orthodoxy to have a future, it needed to have a strong ideological educational home and we needed to start earlier. And so he put a lot of investment into that project. There were a number of projects like that in London um, and beyond that the rabbi had tried to um, had tried to uh, gener uh, to um, catalyze and um, have generative conversations, often bringing in people from around the world to speak. And I do want to say something about uh, myself as a woman, um, as a, as a female student because uh, this was a 30, over 30 years ago. And I never felt for one moment that Rabbi Sachs treated me differently than he did the rabbinic students or other male graduate students. Uh, so much so that I wasn't conscious of the fact that in my career, that would not be the case in other places I would be um, teaching in Israel and unfortunately teaching in the United States, um, facing a degree of um, of questioning, questioning competence, questioning knowledge, that was just never the case. And if you have been watching tributes to Rabbi Sachs, so if you heard Prince Charles and his outstanding Hebrew, may I say, um, rumor has it, I have it on good word, that he asked his private secretary to check in on all the pronunciations of Yehi Zichro Baruch, uh, which is which is very impressive. If you've been watching The Crown, you know that Prince Charles is not getting, you know, he's not, not. Uh, so I just wanna speak in his defense in this moment that he, uh, he gave a beautiful tribute to him. But if you've been paying attention to the tributes, so there's one um, LSJS did, and then there's one that came out of the um, out of Rabbi Sachs's office. Uh, there were what seemed to me an equal number of men and women. Um, there was no there was no attempt, as there so often is in the Orthodox community, to sort of have a representative female. Um, I think that that was part of his genius. He was really just interested in ideas, and he was interested in growing leaders who would promulgate important Jewish ideas to the world at large. Um, that was the source of a lot of controversy in his rabbinate, because I think what Rabbi Sachs understood, and in some strange way, I, I blame the narrowness and parochialness of some, uh, some aspects, elements in his own community, that he understood that there was limited success to be had in the rather small Orthodox community. Remember, chief rabbi didn't mean chief rabbi of England. Uh, it meant chief rabbi of the United Synagogue, right? It was just relatively limited. And I think he understood that where his words were really resonating was in the faith community in Britain, were with an archbishop, uh, with members of parliament, that he had a voice and a voice of faith. So as Brother Allen said, when people wanted a moral op opinion about a moral issue in England, no matter what faith they came from or no faith at all, they turned to Rabbi Sachs. And what a Kiddush Hashem that is to be the voice of morality in Britain. And one could easily say in, um, in the English speaking world. Um, so um, I wanna show you actually, because uh, to the degree that you can understand the influence that he had on me, this is the letter that I saved. Um, some of you may have been my, heard my tribute at KMS and I mentioned this. This is a letter that I saved. You could see Jews College London, um, that when Rabbi Sachs uh, was the chief, was, before he was the chief rabbi, when he was my dissertation advisor. And he was the one who encouraged me to, I do hope you'll go on to write a doctorate. And, um, and he, uh, and he, he uh, said that I hope for the sake of Am Yisrael, you'll continue teaching and that you take your capabilities as far as possible in Limud Torah. So I think that was for me at a very tender age, 
um, the approbation of someone of his stature meant a great deal to me. And I know many, many younger, uh, younger students who had a similar experience with Rabbi Sachs. I'll mention one of them because I imagine some of you have studied with Alex Israel, who was actually my student at Jews College. Um, and I encouraged Alex, who had a question, to approach Rabbi Sachs. He was a high school student at the time, to approach Rabbi Sachs. And Rabbi Sachs really spoke to him very profoundly and deeply about his issue. And he was inspired enough to say, this is a profession that I want to pursue. So um, any questions, observations? You're welcome to unmute. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Erica, <laughs> you probably seen Hamilton. You remember the phrase, why do you write like you're running out of time? It yes. struck me the way that Rabbi Sachs wrote, almost the same as if he was running out of time. Yeah, I'm, and that is such a beautiful observation and I never connected it. Um, and I think, one of the things that's very striking is that Rabbi Sachs did not waste a moment. Um, when he was in the car, Elaine drove and he, and, he, and he read, right? Or he wrote, or he was always preparing. And so if you speak to anyone who worked closely with Rabbi Sachs, and it wasn't that he was a workaholic in a classic sense. It was, I think that he was driven. He had such a sense of purpose. And he had a sense that that purpose um, wasn't something that you took a break from, right? You, you, you know, you take a holiday from work or you take a break from work, which I hope all of you are going to do, because I know during COVID, this is a natural time to take a break, but I've talked to a lot of people who said, well, I can't go anywhere. I might as well be on email. I might as well, uh, as, uh, you know, to follow the expression of, um, I think it was uh, um, This American Life, a broadcast journalist said, it's not, let's not call it working from home, let's call it living at work. Um, so I think uh, Rabbi Sachs actually, for him, as Churchill said that, you know, if you find a job you love, you'll never work another day in your life. And I think that's really the way that he saw the work that he had to do was there was, a, there's always someone, there's always someone to help, there's always someone who needs you. And he made incredible time. He gave incredible access to people to the degree they just heard in a tribute this past Sunday that um, when the current chief rabbi, Rabbi Mervis, took over, Rabbi Sachs explained that every Friday, any rabbi, he left blank so that any rabbi could visit him or talk or call him um, so that he would give that time, you know, give that time away. And for a person who, to Nina's point, who, who was so particular about time, the fact that he invested it and he opened it and Rabbi Mervis simply couldn't understand how a person with, those, with that degree of responsibility um, you know, had opened up. I, I remember seeing Rabbi Sachs, I think it was the first year I saw him in Israel when he, whenever he would come to Israel or later when I moved in the States, I would always make a point of, of seeing him and, uh, and learning from him. And I said, Rabbi Sachs, how's it going? It was the first year of the chief rabbinate. He said, oh, Erica, I can't read. And all I do is eat salmon dinners. Um, and, um, but I didn't believe that for a minute. I mean, I'm sure he ate a lot of salmon dinners. Of that, I have no doubt. Uh, but I think that, um, that, that he was always reading and he was always writing and he was always speaking. And um, after he died, I, I wanna share with you that a, uh, a, a student of mine who lives in Canada, an older gentleman um, wrote to me to share this story. He said he was very, very distressed that um, he was very distressed about why Jews argue with each other. And he, he was so, he want, so much wanted an answer to this question that he asked the office of the chief rabbi when Rabbi Sachs was chief rabbi, can I visit London to ask Rabbi Sachs this question? So I just wanna put on the table how amazing that is that a person has a question that is so important, he's willing to cross the Atlantic to get the answer to this question. So he, uh, so the rabbi, the rabbi's, uh, the office said that, you know, he was not available, but they would make a time for him. And Erev Sukkot, Rabbi Sachs called at 8 a.m. Montreal time. And uh, this friend asked this question. And Rabbi Sachs uh, said, you've asked a very difficult question. It's very difficult to understand why, why people fight with each other, why Jews fight with each other, why we can't be more united. Um, and he gave him a lesson that he said he took with him, he's taken with him his whole life. And that is Rabbi Sachs said, you know, when you read the book of 
uh, of Breshit, when you read Genesis and you read the beginning of Genesis, and um, and God keeps saying, "He tov, it's good, it's good." He says, "Man wasn't created then. Who do you think God was talking to?" And so this, you know, this friend didn't know what to say, and he said, and he said to Rabbi Sachs, "I'm not a very knowledgeable person. I don't know the answer." And Rabbi Sachs said, "It was God talking to Himself." He says, and the lesson is that you have to tell yourself, Kito, you have to tell yourself, the work that I do is good. And sometimes um, when you tell yourself that enough, you'll be able to build bridges with those who don't agree with you, which I thought was very, very powerful and prescient and, um, and had, had a, a, a long tail in terms of its impact. I will also say that Rabbi Sachs, probably the two strangest letters that Elaine Sachs received were from two prisoners who uh, who had studied Rabbi Sachs's Torah with uh, with a clergy who was stationed at the prison. And one of them was actually going to be there for life for, for murder. And he wrote apparently a beautiful condolence letter. So I wanna just share like little pieces. It was, we tend to think of this prolific writer um, and he was, he would disappear into his shed, um, his garden shed, which was, what you would call a garage that had been converted into his library. And he would spend um, six to eight weeks in what he called a trance. That was his trance. And that's when he wrote the base of his, of all of his, uh, his books. And then, um, and that was the time that he needed to clear so that he could think about issues. So I wanted to share an issue that comes up in a lot of his writing and, um, and I, I actually want to share, I'm going to start actually with something on Parshat Vayigash from this book, which is Lessons in Leadership. And I'm going to start with Vayigash and then we're going to, I'm going to share my screen and we'll learn a little bit of Torah together. So this is how he begins this essay. I was once present when the great historian of Islam, Bernard Lewis, was asked to predict the course of events in the Middle East. Actually, I shouldn't say that. I should say it the English way. Bernard Lewis. Uh, I'm a historian. This is what this Lewis wrote. I'm a historian, so I only make predictions about the past. What is more, I am a retired historian, so even my past is passé. Predictions, Rabbi Sachs writes, are impossible in the affairs of living, breathing human beings because we are free and there's no way of knowing in advance how an individual re will react to the great challenges of his or her life. And he was writing this in regard to Yosef, right? In Joseph's very, um, very circuitous, nonlinear path. But I actually want to think about this in terms of Rabbi Sachs himself, this notion that predictions are impossible in the affairs of the living, and there's no way to know in advance how an individual will react. So to that point, when I was speaking with Dan, um, his, uh, who worked in his office and worked so close, one of the people who worked most closely with him, um, he said to me, he only knew how sick Rabbi Sachs was on the Friday before Rabbi Sachs passed away. Rabbi Sachs passed away on Shabbat. Um, he understood that Rabbi Sachs wasn't well but he did not understand what that meant. In other words, Rabbi Sachs really did not want to communicate even to those close to him how sick he was because he wanted to continue with the vibrancy of learning and teaching and um, really up to his last moment. And I think the unpredictability of life was one of the things that people turn to because he was a person in an unpredictable situation who communicated hope. When I heard, it was I heard it at the same time as I heard the election results, and it was so it was very bittersweet for me as a Democrat. Am I allowed to say that? Okay, I'm going to say that. Um, it was very hard for me to hear the news at a time when I felt a, a huge existential relief. But the death of Rabbi Sachs meant that I didn't have someone to turn to to understand. How are we supposed to process this? How are we supposed to bring the community together? His brother Alan said, look on, and I'm, I'm going to invite you to do this. Uh, if you want to know how to heal a country with fracture, look at Rabbi Sachs's BBC interview after Brexit. It's about eight or nine minutes long. And um, where you had a 
a, a, a whole nation that was really polarized around this decision and how Rabbi Sachs sort of stepped in as the voice of conscience around what healing looks like at, at a time like this. So I just invite you to, to, to look at that. But I think one of the, the losses for me, and um, I will say I am, um, I'm actually quite poised now, but I have cried through several tributes um, and, um, and many, many of his other students have felt the same because I think all of us, I, have never perhaps been in the presence of someone so extraordinary and uh, still trying to understand the loss. And part of the loss I'm understanding for people who did not meet him, who wrote to me and said, thank you for crying. I've never met Rabbi Sachs, but I find myself tearing up all the time. And uh, so I've been thinking about that. And I think his genius was that he could take a complex situation and complex, difficult situation and find something redemptive in it. And through that redemption, create hope for other people. That was a very strong theme for him. We're gonna look at covenant as a theme, uh, but hope is a, is, it appears throughout his writings and throughout his videos and in his speaking, and even in his yellow ties. He used to wear a yellow tie uh, because it, it, he, he loved being cheerful and he used to tell jokes. I'm just going to say, I never found his jokes funny, but, um, and he would tell old jokes, like they were old Jewish jokes. He always said that he was very theatrical, so they landed well, but he, he, he did have a very joyful sense about him. There was nothing sort of heavy and burdensome about him, even when he was speaking about difficult situations. And I've thought a lot about that as an educator, in terms of the responsibility not to be Pollyannish about complex situations, but to really say, um, can, I, can I articulate a truth and a difficulty? Because he did talk about very difficult themes. The only time I ever saw him actually, I would say very disgruntled and upset was, uh, was around anti-Semitism in Europe, which I think he never thought would uh, would sort of repopulate in Germany, in France, in, in England. I think that was very, very hard for him. And, um, but I, I think even there, he tried to give a message to the world that anti-Semitism may start with the Jews, but it doesn't end with the Jews. And so therefore it's not ultimately a Jewish problem, it's a societal problem. Um, any other observations before we go on to covenant? Observations, questions, if I can answer them. Yes, I, I had, hi Erica, George hi. Johnson. I just wanted to ask you uh, what influence he had, the rabbi had on, on the United Hebrew congregations itself. I mean, was he successful at all in broadening their outlook? I mean, look, I, 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 I can't say. I lived in England for a relatively short period of time, but I think in terms of building a school and building up respect for the chief rabbinate, right? The chief rabbinate, as we see in Israel, with all kinds of questions about the chief rabbinate, it's really an old institution. I mean, he was inheriting a very old institution and he breathed a lot of fresh life into it. And I think people saw him as, a, as a, this remarkable ambassador. I mean, when I think of Rabbi Sachs, I mentioned hope, we'll talk about covenant, but I, he was such a kiddush Hashem. And so I think, um, I think the United Synagogue movement saw in him a representative to the world. He brought dignity to the post. And I think in so doing it, you know, his messages, the fact that, it, that his messages were read in the, all around the English speaking world. He was effectively the chief rabbi, not of the United Synagogue as many of the chief rabbis were, but really the English speaking world. And I think that's, you know, that, that, that speaks volumes. Uh, you know, I, I, I the, remember the English speaking world it, uh, or I should say, English Anglo Jewry is very, very small. It is smaller than the number of Jews in Teaneck, New Jersey, right? So we're not talking about a really large community, um, but I th the English speaking world is very large. And so I think, especially when he stepped down from all of the um, administrative responsibilities that were connected with that position, all the, you know, uh, the, the, the positions of state and places where he had to be, I think he had much more time to become really the unofficial chief rabbi of the world. But I do want to say, George, to your point um, about bringing dignity to the position, uh, I was speaking to someone also who worked closely with him. And he said, to, I said, tell me something about, like, tell me a little story, something that would help me like think about this loss. And he said, you know, Erica, sometimes I would speak badly about our colleagues. You know, you have a bad day. Someone says something that isn't nice. So I would gossip about them. And Rabbi Sachs would look at me and he would say, dignity, 
dignity. And so even in very small ways, um, so I've been, I've been thinking about that a lot and trying in my own way, um, not to necessarily absorb all the philosophy and the sociology, which of course is important. I've been doing a lot of that reading, but to really think in very small ways about how to change my life in relation to this legacy. And one of them is, if I'm about to say something that's not nice, I say, Erica, dignity. So, um, so, and I, I think that's really what he brought the United Synagogue movement. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Well, Any what other did, yeah. What, what did, uh, could you speak specifically? Hi, how are you? Hi. Uh, <laughs> can you speak specifically about what he wanted to do with respect to orthodoxy or modern orthodoxy and uh, in what direction, what factors, what did he bring into the to the uh, modern Orthodox world that wasn't there before and uh, is there now or should be there now? Yeah, so um, so I I, 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 um, I don't have, I thought I had this book and I, I, so I actually have a copy of his book called Traditional Alternatives, which was part of a, uh, the first year that I lived in London, he brought people from all around the world to speak about mod at a conference on modern orthodoxy. He brought Rabbi Jack Beeler, right, um, the former Morad Outra of KMS Synagogue, because Rabbi Beeler had done a lot on modern orthodox education. He brought Leah Shaktiel, who was a controversial figure at the time. She was on the Moetzet, um, on the Moetzet Dati to the religious council, the first woman to be on a religious council in Israel, in the city of Yerucham. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. 30 plus years ago, he brought her to speak. He brought Ruvain Bolka from Canada. Um, he brought, I, I'm trying to think of who else came. I mean, it was, it was, it was Rabbi Riskin. It was like this sparkling um, gathering. And um, I'd never been to anything you know, before that or since that it had that sort of heft and substance to it. And so one thing Rabbi Sachs felt it was important that people not only think about their individual institutions, but they gather together to think about key issues, um, whether it's women in Judaism, whether it's um, whether it's it's um, it's uh, uh, the integration of J Judaism and secular studies. And I think his lasting his lasting contribution was to have one foot in in Torah and one foot in um, in uh, general studies. And, and to straddle those things and always bring Torah to your general studies and general studies to your Torah. I think he inhabited that world in ways that were, was very accessible. I mean, I think you can see that in Rav Soloveitchik's writings and you can see that in Rav Aaron Lichtenstein's writings, but their writings in many ways are for the intellectually elite. And I think what Rabbi Sachs tried to do was bring them into our homes in books and in writings on the Parsha, right? So I think I think that was his contribution was to show you can walk in those worlds together and in a very integrated and holistic way and not feel that you're compromising one or the other. Um, so I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but that's certainly what I what I would take away from it. Thank you. Erica? Yeah. Hi, it's Rachel. Um, Erica, I'm so glad you mentioned his joy because one of the most wonderful things during the pandemic was a big event and it was with a woman journalist and I think it was with you, Shai Rivo. Mm -hmm. Did anybody, anybody see this? It was a wonderful musical event. And um, Rabbi Sachs was interviewing this, Shai Rivo is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And and um, they were playing music. I, I, I can't, it's sometime during the pandemic, but I'd never seen him like that. Very informal, you know, mm -hmm. not without a jacket on. And he was loving the music. Um, so oh, I'm so yeah, glad that, you reminded yeah, me of that. That's a lovely image. Now he was very formal. I, I have to say, I'd never saw him without a tie. I'm trying to think if I ever saw him without a suit jacket. In fact, Alan shared that on a, on a summer holiday, he did go to the beach in a tweed jacket and tie. So do with that what you may, that was his brother's, uh, that was his brother's recollection. Um, he did bring formality and I think that, that part of dignity, but to the point about joy, it's really, really important, the lightheartedness. Um, I think he always, it was one of the reasons he loved speaking to students. He made my, my brother-in-law, I have a much younger brother-in-law who was in Cambridge and Rabbi Sachs would regularly go up several times a semester 
to speak to the kids in JSOC or the Jewish Society, he felt that students were, that was always his priority were children, uh, children and students. And, um, you know, this is, this is a mind that really, that really could spend time with philosophers and, and chose instead to really invest in children. Uh, I think that he saw the joy and that he reflected the joy and thank God he was able to enjoy his own grandchildren. Um, not, not for long enough, not for long enough. Um, you know, I think very often of uh, Midrash about Moshe and Moshe, you know, Moshe stopping the writing of the Torah. And um, there are there are several different midrashim about that, and I, I think about all the Torah all the time that he won't write, that we won't enjoy from him, and yet we can see just how prolific he is. That after his death, several books have come out, um, and I think there will be many more. I think there will be many more um, as people go through his writings and um, and share things that were otherwise not produced. So I want to I want to take some time now. I'm going to share my screen. Um, I'm actually not enabled to share my screen, so. I don't know if someone can remedy that for me. Anyone remedy that for me? Let's see. Okay, great. Now it should can... be good now. Sorry about that. Outstanding. Okay, great. So can you see my screen? Okay, so I wanted to share with you what I think is such a joy. It's my like my favorite, my favorite picture of him, uh, photo of him. This is him receiving the Templeton Prize. Um, it's really one of the most prestigious prizes in religion. I encourage you to go on the website, um, and you could see the characteristic yellow tie. Um, you you know you you know that I'm telling you the truth when I uh, when you see that him in that tie. So. I want to share with you a theme that in that very first book, Traditional Alternatives, he wrote about, and that and that really um, one of the ways that you can understand the themes that were important, and I invite you to do this, is to look at an index of his work. First of all, they're phenomenal because sometimes you'll have like a, a, a morality. Uh, if any of you have morality in front of you, look up Mick Jagger, right? Mick Jagger is there and he'll like he'll have he'll have a contemporary person. You just don't expect it next to a philosopher, next to a sociologist, next to a major rabbinic figure. Um, and uh, but covenants have, uh, have, so if you look up covenant or covenantal, you'll see there's almost always a list, many, many listings there in virtually every one of his books. I, I haven't come across, um, I haven't come across any of his writings. Where, and, and he called his, his weekly uh, uh, Parsha Sheets a covenant conversation as if to say the conversation was always in some way going to go back to a covenant. So what I wanna look at is a scene from Harsinai and I want to frame it within his understanding of covenant. What God is proposing at Sinai is not a contract, but a covenant. And this is from the home we build together. And I'll talk about that in a moment. Covenants were a familiar feature of politics in the ancient Near East. There were secular treaties, usually between a strong nation and a weak one. They set out the terms of a relationship. The strong power would protect the weak in return for which the weak would pledge its loyalty and fealty to the strong. The Bible takes this idea and makes revolutionary use of it. It is now conceived of as a partnership between God and a people. God will protect them. They know this because he's already rescued them from slavery. In return, they are to pledge themselves to God, obeying his laws, accepting his mission, honoring his trust. The people are free to choose. The fact of choice is fundamental for the Bible portrays God not as an overwhelming force, but as a constitutional monarch. The supreme power makes space for human freedom. This notion of a constitutional monarch, I was actually just thinking about this today in davening, um, how many times in even daily davening, we come across the notion of God as Mela. Certainly on Rosh Hashanah, we, we do that to, uh, to an even greater degree. But the idea of HaKadosh Baruch Hu as a constitutional monarch means that the king is limited in the, in the, in the um, authority that he can exert. The king, just like the, his constituents, have to obey a code which, um, which both of them partner sometimes in developing or, or both of them partner in observance. And so for Rabbi Sachs, this was a very important aspect of the way human beings relate to God, the way that God relates to human beings and Jews specifically, and the way that human beings have to model the relationships they have with each other. So 
at this point, what he shared here is that a contract in, in, in you know, a, a contract is really a secular treaty between a strong and, and it, it originating in between nations where a strong one makes a, a contract with a weak one. And it's always directed at the strong, right? So I'm going to pledge, if I'm the weak one, I'm pledging loyalty to the strong. I'm maybe I'm bringing um, gifts, regular gifts uh, to make sure that the strong doesn't exploit or take advantage of me. And he says what the Hebrew Bible in, introduced into the world was that not a contract, but a covenant. And that has to be entered into volitionally. Um, and so in Radical Then, Radical Now, uh, which, which one of his disciples believes is the book that contains all of his major ideas. Uh, so if you haven't read it, that's a good, that's a good uh, advertisement. Uh, he says, a covenant is what turns love into law and law into love. And that's an added dimension of what a covenant does. It's entered into volitionally, but its goal is to use law to build a relationship of love. And the home we build together, uh, Continuum had uh, Continuum publishes books in England. The basic books did many of his books here, and then Cohen did a lot of his Jewish studies books. But this book, the home we build together, I I, I don't know. I'm not I'm not uh, you know stopping the screen share by a show of hands for for those who can tell me if you've heard this book. This is a very British book, and so a lot of Americans are not familiar with it. It's actually one of my favorite books of Rabbi Sachs's because I think he was setting out a very bold agenda to the general population. If you're paying attention to the way Rabbi Sachs writes, a book like Morality is not written in large part for the Jewish community, but for, for the, the human community, right? For all the citizens of the world. Um, and, and he would, he would you know, um, some, work on Jewish books that were exclusively for the Jewish community and often, often for people who were familiar with Jewish ideas, but then he wrote other books. And um, this book, The Home We Build Together, was his book where he was trying to address a niggling problem in British society, namely, that uh, there was a lot of lip service to multiculturalism and uh, having lived in London and um, visit London uh, quite frequently, there are, you know, I mean, you walk down a London street and you hear so many different languages and there's so many different kinds of food and there's so many different kinds of dialects. And what he felt was that multiculturalism wasn't working. It just didn't work. And the reason it didn't work, he said, is that, uh, that England treated immigrants as if they were visiting a country home. Now it's nice to be invited to a country home, especially you know if you've been watching Downton Abbey or perhaps you've been watching The Crown. What else do we do right now? Um, that uh, that in these large country homes that they're very beautiful and perhaps you're going to be treated very nicely when you're in the country home. But if you're a guest in a country home, you don't feel at home to open up the refrigerator. You can't walk about as if you you own part of this. In fact, you might not even want to touch certain things. And he was concerned that immigrants coming to England felt like they were guests in a country home rather than the citizens that they were. And so he said, instead of the country home that, that, that you're invited to, our job is to build a home together. And that was the, that's the conceit. That was the central thought. And he talks about covenants as an element, as, a, as opposed to a contract. If you stay here this many years, you can become a citizen. And if you're a citizen, this is um, the, the, these are the rules that apply to you. That doesn't create a real feeling of patriotism, a sense of nationalism, which of course has its dangers, but a sense of togetherness. Um, and I think he did see that Americans had that um, in larger, in, in, in a more significant ways in many ways, the sense of American patriotism than, um, than, than the English had. Uh, but you, you know, uh, when you think of a violent soccer game uh, or a call football game taking place in England, um, there was a sense that this wasn't a safe place for many people. Uh, and, and at some point it wasn't, uh, he, you know, as, as he made known, it wasn't always safe for Jews to be there, but he he was the sort of the voice in high places to call out anti-Semitism and to understand that in a true multicultural society, it's not that that Muslims are uh, fighting um, anti-Islamic statements on their own, but rather the, that that we're all fighting any kind of hatred together because that's what it means to have this covenant. Um, so I want to share with you what I think. 
I haven't heard him teach this, um, but uh, he was interested in the whole Sinai experience. What I think are maybe the most important psukim are not actually, uh, the most important verses are not actually the Ten Commandments, um, which I, you know, you know, don't, don't, don't quote me on that. I, I don't mean it in the sense that, you know, of lawlessness, but I, I think that um, if you look at the 10 commandments on some level, they're very, very basic. They're not asking us to have an extremely high ethical standard, although, although uh, it would be nice if everyone kept them, but they're, they're sort of the basic building blocks of a society of a trusting society. If you look, however, at the conversation that Moshe and HaKadosh Baruch Hu have right before the giving of the Ten Commandments, you'll see something very, very powerful indeed about turning covenant into love. Um, so it was three months after we left Egypt. Certainly that experience was fresh on the mind. And on that day, they entered the wilderness of Sinai. So this is a scary thing. You're entering a wilderness. And so they go to Rafidim, they go, they're in this wilderness, and they camp there. And they camp via So they're opposite the mountain which Moshe will climb. And uh, So God says, um, you should say this to the house of Jacob, Yaakov, and declare to the children of Israel. There's a famous Rashi and Midrashim on this. Uh, but this idea is, there's a message that I need you to share with everyone. And specifically, Rashi says, where Moshe often paraphrased, in this, in this, in what God was telling him to say, he needed to say every single part of it. And here's what he said. And you know this speech. So if we're going to look at this as covenants that turn into love, God says to the Jews, not as a statement of you owe me, but I want to explain to you why I've made this investment why I took you out on eagle's wings, and I brought you to me. It's a very, very endearing image of taking someone out of slavery and bringing them to yourself. And it was, I, I want to be in relationship with you. Many times people enter a contract, they're not interested in a relationship. It's very transactional. I'm going to get what I can get out of this, and then I'm going to get out of here. But I'm bringing you to me. And if you listen to my voice, notice that if you listen. Now, of course, there'll, there'll be people who translate im as, you know, when you listen. But I think it's if you will listen. And that's, to Rabbi Sachs's point, that you enter into a contract, into a covenant volitionally. If I brought you to me, I want to have this relationship, but I can only have it if we both agree to the terms. And notice the word ata, and now, like, I brought you here, and now we're going to start a new relationship. I'm not going to hold again it against you, or or you're indebted to me forever for this act. I want you to think of where we're starting now. Ushmartem et briti. If you observe this covenant, ve'item li segula. We're going. To, you're going to be treasured, right? You're going to be very special. It was. I brought you to me, and if it's in your interest, if you're interested in this relationship, you will, you will be a treasure to me. Mikola amim kili kola eretz, from all the nations. It was, I, I have rule, I have authority over the world, and I have, I, and, 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 I, and I want to have this relationship with you. Vatemt you li memlecha konim begoy kadosh, and you will be, and this is the, the entirety of what he says, you will be a, a nation of leaders and a holy nation. Now, if you, these are people, these are slaves. Three months ago, they were doing laundry. They were making bricks. They were putting the bricks, uh, the cementing the bricks into buildings. Not a one of them thought, Mamlecha Kohanim? And I, I'm going to translate it as I think is accurate to where the, the way that the term Kohen appears in some places in Tanakh. Not that you're going to be all priests, but that you're going to be all leaders. I think the idea that you would have authority 
by virtue of this partnership was totally unlike enslavement. Enslavement is basically a contract. I'm going to do all of these things for you, my boss, so you don't kill me. Um, and that's very different than saying, I am trying to create a partnership almost of equals, right? I have authority and you will have authority, but more than authority and more important always than authority is that you'll be a goy kadosh, that with this authority, you will become a holy people. If you look throughout Tanakh, it's a very, very ambivalent relationship to power um, that comes through in kingship, that comes through in uh, it, with Kohanim, that comes through with Shoftim. Um, there's there the, and their stories, and they're profound, and they're numerous stories of leaders who have sinned because they got the Mamlecha Kohanim piece, but they forgot the Goy Kadosh piece. And then it says, Elo Advarim Asheretz Deber El Bnei Israel. So the sandwich of saying, to Rashi's point, these are the words that you need to say. And as before I give you law, I need you to understand something about the relationship that I want to build with you. Um, and only then can you give law. And that's why I said, in some ways, this speech was more important than the Sarah Dibro because it was going to frame the rest of Jewish living. The rest of the Jewish commandments that would be given really needed to be given with this sense of, I want to be in a relationship with you. And I believe that you will be transformed by virtue of that relationship. And that, by the way, um, leads to what we see is in the last pasuk here, v'yanu kol ha'am yachtav, yamru kol asher daber Hashem na'aseh. As the people say, this is the kind of God we want to be in relationship with. And then Moshe brought the words back to God, right? So this, this was a volitional agreement. So let's look at a few other statements about covenant. Covenant, Rabbi Sack says, is an answer to the most fundamental question in the evolution of societies. How can we establish relationships secure enough to become the basis of cooperation without the use of economic, political, or military powers? The use of power is ruled out by the requirement of human dignity. If you and I are linked, because one way or another, I can force you to do what I want, then I have secured my freedom at the cost of yours. I have asserted my humanity by denying yours. Covenant is the attempt to create partnership without dominance. I should create, you know, just, isn't that great? You could just check it one and correct it. Well, a partnership without dominance or submission, right? So that idea that in a, if a relationship is not transactional, um, and it's not doesn't represent an imbalance of power, then then I don't secure my freedom by compromising yours. A covenant. So this is from the Dignity of Difference, is one of his most controversial books, and a book that that he had to retract some parts of because he faced uh, some um, rather difficult. Um, uh, rather difficult controversies and challenges, resistance um, from his own community, the people who felt it was, it was too open. Um, uh, but I have a first edition copy, so uh, happy, to, uh, happy to look at what he originally wrote. He says, a covenant is not a contract. It differs in three respects. It's not limited to specific conditions and circumstances. It's open-ended and long lasting. It, and is not based on the idea of two individuals, otherwise unconnected, pursuing personal advantage, right? So you're in a business relationship and we're gonna create some conditions and those conditions will be short-term. Um, that's not what a covenant is. It's open-ended and long lasting. It's not about the fulfillment of certain activities or conditions, it's really about the relationship itself. It's about the we that gives identity to the I. And if you're reading morality, you'll notice he talks a lot about this, about we and I. This was a book that he wrote in 2002, almost 20 years ago, but he still kept that very, very concerned about the movement from the we to the I. There's a place for contracts, but covenants are prior and they're more fundamental. Now, what's striking about this, the dignity of difference came out of lectures that he gave the World Economic Forum, not a place that normally has a rabbi um, speaking. And so, um, so he was talking about this within the financial sector. He felt that people so much in the, in the corporate world was around contracts and covenants were not a language that was being spoken. He was concerned about that. Um, back to the home we build together. Covenant is a binding commitment entered into by two or more parties to work and care for one another while respecting the freedom, integrity, and difference of each. Covenant is politics without power, economics without self-interest. What difference does it make? 
For one thing, it gets us to think about the common good, the good of all of us together. Now, as a Jewish community, we tend to think very transactionally. This is my shul, this is my school, my federation, my organization that I give. I don't share my lists with anyone because why would I do that? I don't want them to fundraise and then I'll lose out. And actually we've created a, a highly, I think, um, diminished community as a result of the territoriality of, of the not looking at the common good. Because if we could put down those communal walls and say, what should we create so that we can be the best community for people to live in, um, it, it, it may not be what we're currently living in. Um, and, we, and we fail to think that way. He was concerned about that. Um, and we'll, we'll look at the next, um, those bound by covenant voluntarily undertake to share fate. They choose to link their destinies together. They accept responsibilities to and for one another. Covenants redeem the solitude of the lonely crowd. And he will speak a lot about immorality, about loneliness. He was very concerned um, and very common to his thinking is he'll quote, not in addition to philosophers, sociologists and polls and research. He's very interested in polls and research because he was interested in the percentage of people who felt isolated, who felt that they did not live in community, who were outside of traditional family, um, family structures. And as a result, were in Putnam's words, bowling alone. To enter into a covenant, like deciding to marry or have a child, is to take a risk, an act of faith in an unknown, unknowable future. Um, and so for him, um, marriage uh, and family life was really the microcosm for building community and covenants in the in the world at large. Um, so I, um, yeah, I uh, just end with this last quote, uh, covenant is the politics of quest for the promised land, the place of freedom, the society that honors the dignity of all. He saw in covenant the key to creating a different kind of society. And that's why I think he never let go of that idea. He saw that technology was wearing away, was making people transactional in the way that they related to each other. And um, yeah, and I, I can say as a student that I felt that I had a covenantal relationship with Rabbi Sachs. I think that many of us have teachers and we move away, we do something else, you know, they stop teaching us. And although I wasn't in his classroom, was no longer in his classroom, I felt that I was constantly learning from him because of his books. I felt that I, um, I, I was watching him um, produce uh, much of the same wise Torah year after year after year. And he believed very profoundly, and it's, it's one of the things that gets me through COVID, is that um, you know when you when you when you do something good, you can't give up on it, no matter what the conditions are. Um, the things that we believe in, we continue to believe in. And he believed that we need to create covenantal societies, and that each and every one of us need to make contributions so that covenantal societies flourish. That's not someone else's job. That's our job. And so I will, uh, I will finish with that, uh, with that legacy and that thought. What are you, or that question, what are you doing to help build a covenantal community? Thank you very much. Shabbat shalom. Thank and you. Thank you. I know that you could have had Chinese food tonight, so I'm so glad that you joined me. <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Um, you. Do you do you want to take questions or comments or hellos okay. for if, uh, it's for so, anyone uh, who anyone who wants to go? That's fine. And we'll maybe for the next five minutes or so, we can take some questions in case that Chinese food is getting cold. I don't know. Erica, I just wanted to comment, and it was terrific. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, when at the beginning of the quotes that you were citing, uh, the uh, there was uh, Nasev and Nishma, mm. and uh, the, the, one of the fundamental things that underlies everything else there is trust. Yeah. And That's the fact true. that the Jewish people, uh, the Israelites at Sinai, said, "Okay, we don't have not, we don't have to read this. <laughs> we trust you. Right. <laughs> we agree." <laughs> well, look. It, you know, it's interesting because on the one hand, we agree, but we're also, um, and Rev Salvechik points uh, to this in an essay of his, you know, we did get some, we did get the parameters of the responsibilities, right? But I think that the willingness comes because of the first speech, right? Because God said, I brought you here to me and I'm interested in this relationship and it means something to me. And I think there's something very special about this bond. And I think 
for all of us, you know, if someone gives us something to do, and we've all had bosses who said, do this, do that, and the other thing. And you're like, yeah, I don't really like you. I mean, I'm going to do it, but I'm not going to really do it. But sometimes you have a boss and you will go through fire for that person because there's trust, because that person has your interest at heart and they've invested in you and they believe in you. And I think that's, I, I think that's a message that's important for our children to hear. It's important, uh, you know, for our employees to hear. Um, it's important to say, you know, I trust you. I love you. Look what I'm going to show you right now. This is what I keep in my desk. <laughs> this is a little rock. It says trust. Um, you know, and I, I, I try. Wait here. I'm going to show you something else on my desk. Um, start with yes. Um, and um, and I think that was. I mean that that was really. I think with Rabbi Sachs. I think he always saw possibility in things. And even when he faced some, some hardships in his um, in the chief rabbi, I mentioned the dignity of difference and you can look into that controversy. He always stayed above the fray. Um, I think his, his world of possibilities was very wide and broad. And so he was able to really kind of transcend, almost levitate above the difficulties and see the possibility. And that's why I think he's, he's, he's so associated with hope. Erica, I have a question for you. This is Stu Milner. Hi. Hi, Erica. I'm reading Rabbi. The two of you, you look like you're on Star Trek, and Scotty's going to beat me up any second. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, and reading the book about morality, I'm wondering about Rabbi Sachs's position on ethics vis-a-vis -vis morality. Um, I mean, look, he outlines that in the book there, he talks about it often, you know, um, of whether, you know, morality is natural, and there's a lot of, you know, philosophical d debate around that. Um, you know, it's, it's not always clear that every society understands what good and bad is in the same way, right? Um, I think he was very concerned with relativism, as, as was true for a number of uh, conservative philosophers. I think he, he was concerned that we've become, you know, that, that, um, that we think so relatively about ethics, that it's not always clear to someone what right and wrong is. Um, I think he brings mm -hmm. example morality, which I actually think was from Alan Bloom's book, Closing of the American Mind. He doesn't cite Bloom. Uh, but he, he, he seems to make an oblique reference when, you know, Bloom asked people about, you know, the Holocaust and, you know, were Nazis wrong and his students in university couldn't say, this, I think it was University of Chicago, couldn't say that, that the Nazis were wrong. You know, everything was relative, you know, they were contextualizing and what about this fact and what about that fact? And I think, I think he was concerned that people couldn't come out and say, there's something wrong. And, um, and I think that, I think um, just in terms of practical ethics, I think he was very concerned that anti-Semitism was really coming out of this sense of relativism and, and certainly intersectionality, things like intersectionality, where you take one suffering and then everyone's suffering would be connected to it. And, um, and, and then you couldn't really narrow uh, the field and think carefully about your ethical responsibilities to people. And I think actually, if you're in a relationship, if you're in a covenantal relationship, what, what are my responsibilities to you? And I think he felt it was important that leaders throughout Tanakh argued with God, because if I'm in a partnership with you and, you, and you're falling down on the job, you're letting people die. You're, you know, destroying the city of stone. Well, what if there are righteous people there? I think that was for him. Um, and whatever is said in the philosophical world of ethics, which I think you can get out of the book, I think he felt that we have in a partnership, you have to hold God accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. It's so nice to see you. Erica. Yeah. I I what I hear from you in and is that and which is, it inspires me is that we all have our gifts and talents that were given to a God-given gifts and talents that we can share with the world. And contribute, that we can contribute to make a difference. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think though he was concerned specifically in a, uh, and, and um, this idea of uh, that the, he, he would call it the grammar of kindness that exists in communities. And I know Oh Shalom is such a powerful community and it really a tribute to Rabbi Hertzfeld and Mara Ruth and, and really all of you who, have, who invest in community. And I think COVID has really been a test of the durability of our communities. There are a lot of people for understandable health reasons who are not going to shul. And there are a lot of people living in isolation. And I think 
Rabbi Sachs understood that chesed was the glue that kept communities together. And that's why he thought that the Jewish community, Jewish communities that functioned well could really be a light to other to other communities to say like this is what it looks like and so i guess you know i i gave you that little example of um of dignity you know thinking just in in the little ways that rabbi Sachs affects my life um you know i think it's important um and maybe if we have a little extra time on our hands tomorrow to reach out to people who may be isolated and that might be an aunt and that might be i mean Helene, you have such a beautiful voice go sing to somebody um <laughs> but you know it was to the degree that we can reach out to people and check in with people and mind and loving their- yeah, make sure that they're okay. Um, I think we've we've lost a little bit of that, and that 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 worries me. That worries me. Thank you, Thank you. Erica. To finish on a very light note, and I know how much you and I both love him. You said you didn't like his jokes so much. I love the episode. Oh, no. No, 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 this isn't really a joke, but, you know, he went to an Arsenal match and he took with him the Archbishop of Canterbury. And unfortunately, Arsenal lost that day to Manchester. And one of the atheists who he debated with immediately said, you see, there is no God, to which he replied, quick as a flash, not at all. God just wanted Manchester to win today. (laughs) (laughs) That is a good story. That is a good story. Yeah, yeah. Nice, sweet. Um, yes, yeah, not every day that you get to go to um, a sports, uh, you know, sport event with um, with the Archbishop of Canterbury. So he, uh, <laughs> he has special friends. But if you haven't had a chance to listen to the tribute that Prince Charles gave him, I, Wendy and I had discussed this. Um, you know, I, I, I when I heard that he was Prince Charles was speaking, I was thinking, oh, what's he going to say? It's like some formality, and that is not. I mean, this was a tribute to a friend who he trusted and who he sought his advice out on multiple occasions. And and actually, it it really helps you understand what faith can do in a faithless world um, and the way which it can influence. I mean, um, you know, the many, many lessons, I mean, so many I've taken is the importance of, of sharing the gift that we have. Um, when you when you're in a close Orthodox community and you understand kindness, and no one has to explain that to you because we take it as a given, um, but not everyone in the world has that. Not everyone in the world understands what a Shabbat is. You know, I have many people in the days when we could have Shabbat guests, right? Many people on my Shabbat table are not Sabbath observant. I remember one saying, "You know, this is so beautiful." You, you mean to tell me you don't look at your phone for 24 hours? I said, no, 25 hours. Um, he said, well, you know what? I'm very, very busy. I don't think I could do that. And I, like, you know, you want to say, yeah, I'm not busy at all. I just, I just sit here. I don't actually have anyone to call. Um, but I, 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 I do think that a lot of times uh, as a criticism of the modern Orthodox community, as opposed to a community like Chabad, we keep our treasures to ourselves. And in, in our offices, we don't talk about our Sabbath observance, and we don't talk about um, some of the moral decisions that we make and the way communities um, come are there for each other and in very, very important and loving ways. And I, I think Rabbi Sachs showed me that the conversation sometimes that you need to have is not with the fellow Jew, but the fellow Jew listens when you have it with the Archbishop of Canterbury or, or, just, or, or just a person on the street who may need, who may need an act of kindness. Erica, I want to second what you said about Prince Charles's uh, tribute. It was absolutely amazing. And if people haven't, it's easy to find, I think, on YouTube. If anybody hasn't listened to it, take the time to do that. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. You know, look, I, I, I mean, it's, it, it's very hard to understand, Bill, who is going to take his, who's, who's going to take those you know, mm-hmm. sit in, you know, fit in those shoes. No, no one, no one can. Um, and, um, you know, and, and I, and I get, I get quite verklempt when I think about it, but I do think that in some way, all of us have to do this, right? All of us have to do it. I think, you know, uh, if you read um, Rabbi Joseph Tulishkin, if you're looking for some inspiring reading, um, Rabbi Tulishkin's book on the Lubavitcher Rebbe, very, very influential, and Rabbi Sachs is in that book. Um, I, I gave that book out as a gift uh, for the people who hosted uh, my son's Ufruf. And, um, and someone said to me, you gave me a book? Like I was kind of expecting a set of napkins or like, I don't know, whatever it was, flowers or a babka. 
And anyway, the person said, I got to be honest with you, Erica, I didn't look at that book for like eight months and someone else told me to read it. And he goes, I can't believe you didn't tell me to read it. I said, I bought you the book. What do you mean? I didn't tell you to read it. Anyway. Um, and she said, you know, it's, it's really, it, it just so profoundly inspiring to read about a person who is so visionary and, and, do, and has done so much and has mentored so many people. And, um, and so I, you know, I think in a time when we're not, it's, you know, it's maybe so inspired is to, is to read about inspiring people and to say, you know, what, what does it mean to inspire others? What's my responsibility? Which book by Talishkin? It's called The Rebbe. The Rebbe. The Rebbe. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice big book, but it's, it's very quick going. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Really, really. Thank, thank you. you. See you at the next thank class. You. God willing. Have thank a fantastic you. Shabbat. Great to see thank all of you. Thank, thank you. Thank Have you a good so night. much. Thank Take care. The, 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 the,